Okay, hello. Um, can you hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay, good. I'm trying this new software. So far, I'm not sure it really works better than the old software, but we'll see. Because <laughs> um, there's serious lag, isn't there? Are you seeing that? No, well, maybe not. Yeah, lag. <sighs> well, yeah, I really need a more powerful computer, I guess, but oh well. Anyway, yeah, this, it seems to be worse than Manicam, the lag. Maybe if I make it smaller, no, that's no. Uh, oh, well, anyway, it's a little distracting, but I guess you use it, I'm going to use it this time because I have it all set up. Okay. Um, and I'm sorry also for the um, problem there was with the online syllabus. I don't know how long it was off. I think it was right originally um, and it's fixed now, but for some unknown amount of time, like uh, all the dates were off. And I know that confused at least some people. Um, and sorry about that. It should be correct now. Um, so in particular, you know, for a while, I guess it said that the first paper was due tomorrow, whereas it's actually due Monday. Um, that's the most important thing. Um, okay. Um, so with, unless there's questions for no, with no further ado, I'm going to go on to talk about madness. Now, this is, yeah, see what I, <laughs> that's a little strange too. All right, anyway. Um, okay, so madness is, um, the block also calls, or more precisely calls, association of ideas. Um, and he says when he calls it madness, this is book two, chapter 33 on page 354. And now I have to try to do this for the first time and see if it works. Change this to Um, here we go. I shall be pardoned for calling it by so harsh a name as madness. When it is considered that opposition to reason deserves that name and is really madness, and there is scarce a man so free from it, but if that he should always on all occasions argue today, argue or do as in some cases he constantly does, would not be thought fitter for bedlam than civil conversation. Right? So he's saying that this association of ideas that we all do it in certain cases. 
and that in those cases we're literally uh, mad, right? That is mentally ill. If we did the same thing um, in all the time that we always do in those cases, then we would be committed. Um, so, um, And he says, um, you know, he apologizes for calling it such a harsh name. Now, I mean, I think uh, I think, well, I mean, it's pretty clear he's apologizing to the sane people for saying that they're mad. Um, but, uh, you know, Right, that is the same people are complaining, hey, you know, I just do this little thing that everyone does, association of ideas. How dare you call me mad just because of that? I think we could also imagine in our time that the uh, mad people would complain about it, right? They would say like, you know, we have this serious uh, illness, this serious mental illness and, you know, um, we're really suffering from it, and how dare you trivialize it by calling um, this little thing that everyone does, association of ideas, madness. So to both of those people, Locke's response is basically, you have more in common than you realize. Um, we're actually all ill with this type of mental illness. Um, and he defends himself partly by saying that um, he first got onto the importance of association of ideas when he was considering the cause of madness and trying to figure out what that might be. Um, and then he started to realize that, hey, this same thing is the cause of uh, irrationality among people who, uh, we would normally consider sane as well. Now, you know, I mean, whether he's right that, that something like this is the cause of mental illness, I mean, I doubt, like, there's a lot of different things we call mental illness. It seems really unlikely that this particular thing he's talking about could explain all of them. Um, I don't know if it explains any of them, but anyway, uh, he thinks it does. Okay, so, um, so what is this association of ideas um, or madness? Well, um, so to understand what it is, you have to um, first take it, or you have to first realize that Locke thinks there's a natural order that our ideas go in, or a correct order that they go in, and that is the order of reason. So, um, um, this is the next section, chapter two, I mean, book two, chapter 33, section five. Some of our ideas have a natural correspondence and connection one with another. It is the office and excellency of our reason. This doesn't work. What about this? Of our reason. Okay. No, that pointer did not work. It made the recording crash. <laughs> okay. Um, 
So I'll just keep using my finger or nothing maybe because of the lag makes it too. Uh, this is not working out well, unfortunately. But it is the office and excellency of our reason to trace these and hold them together in that union and correspondence, which is founded in their peculiar beings. Besides this, there is another connection of ideas wholly owing to chance or custom. Ideas that in themselves are not at all of kin come to be united. Oops. In some men's minds, some to come to be so united in some men's minds that tis very hard to separate them. Right? So what he's saying is that um, oops. Okay, so what he's saying is that there's a natural order of ideas or a, a correct correspondence or ordering of ideas. And that the office of reason is to put our ideas in the right order. Now, we'll see when we get to this discussion of demonstration in book four, that this is how he thinks a um, uh, demonstrative proof works. It works by reason telling us that these two ideas um, certainly agree with each other or evidently agree with each other and then that these two evidently agree with each other and so forth. And in the end, we reach the conclusion that this idea and this idea agree with each other. And so the conclusion is like if this idea is A, and this idea of B, the conclusion of the demonstrative proof would be A is B. That's how Locke thinks a, a proof, like a, a mathematical proof, for example. But there's also a way that what reason can order ideas not um, to achieve demonstrative certainty, but just to achieve probability. Right? And this is basically something. Professor? Yeah. Sorry to interrupt, it's hard to hear you. Oh, that problem again. All right. Okay, I don't know which one of these mics might work better. How does this sound? Can you do a test while you're standing near the board? I was standing near the board. Did that sound okay when I was? Or should I do it with? Or is this one better? It's calling. Are you them. speaking right now? Because we. <laughs> I was. <laughs> yeah, we can't hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you right now, but not by the board. Okay. Can you hear me now? No? Uh, can, it's a little bit distant. Um, I believe the last time you used HD Pro Camera One. Yeah, the problem is th this is new software and it's just calling okay. them both HD Pro webcam. Gotcha. Not calling one of them number one. So I don't know which is which at all. Um, Okay, if you could kind of hear me when I was over by the board, I think I'm going to stick with this one. Because the other one, it sounded like you couldn't hear me at all when I was near the board. Okay, so what I was saying is that according to Locke, the way a, a proof works, like in mathematics, like where the proof is supposed to achieve demonstrative certainty, the way the proof works is that reason tells us how to put ideas in order 
So we want to know if idea A agrees with idea B, but they don't evidently agree or disagree with each other. So we use reason to set up an ordering of intermediate ideas where we can see that A agrees with this one and this one agrees with this one and so on and so forth. And in the end, we see that A agrees with B and then we conclude with certainty that A is B. But Locke thinks, um, and again, we'll see this um, in book four, that there's also an ordering of ideas um, that reason tells us to make in order to make, uh, in order to reach probable conclusions. So, um, rather than certain conclusions. And this basically is induction, right? So that is, it means that, you know, if I wanna know whether A goes together with B, I look to see the case, whether A always occurs or almost always occurs with some other idea, in fact, and then so on and so forth. And I can see that A, in fact, tends to occur with B. That would be the reasonable way of reaching a conclusion in matters where we like, you know, empirical questions where we don't have the possibility of doing a mathematical proof. Um, so when Locke talks about the order of reason here, I think he's talking about both those orders, but he's saying there's also another order in which the ideas are put together just because we happen to associate two ideas really strongly with each other. Now, I mean, it's a little bit different to understand, a little bit difficult to understand the difference between that and induction. Um, that is, um, and this is important because depending on uh, how you understand that difference is going to be different moral about how Locke or whether Locke agree, disagrees with Hume about how induction works. Because induction also seems to be a matter of custom or habit, right? Like I've, I have generally experienced idea A and idea B together. Um, Right, April says, is that like a spurious, spurious, I guess that's bad, spurious, spurious relationship. Yeah, I mean, but the question is exactly what, how we know it's spurious. I mean, you, so you can definitely tell in um, some cases that it's, you know, so like he talks about forming an association between darkness and scary goblins because you were told scary stories about goblins in the dark when you were a child. So you never actually experienced scary goblins as a consequence of darkness. You never experienced scary goblins at all. So that's obviously not the same as learning by experience that goblins come out in the dark. Um, but I'm not sure what the general rule is, but um, so in any case, um, uh, Locke says, you know, so these are like the rational orders. Of ideas. And in this case, you know, you can't really tell the difference from the pictures. <laughs> the pictures look the same. I mean, I guess the picture for the irrational case looks the same too. Maybe there's no point in drawing more than one picture. The question is what this relationship is, right? If it's evident agreement or disagreement of ideas, then we have demonstrative proof. If that relationship between one idea and the next is um, like, high probability of coming together based on our past experience, then we have uh, rational reasoning about probability. 
right? Where probability here means not, although it's supposed to include, I guess, like strictly speaking, numerical probability, but it just means basically like um, believability, right? So if I say, you know, the sun is going to come up tomorrow, uh, um, like I'm not absolutely certain about it the way I am supposedly that like two plus two equals four or that the angles in a triangle add up to two right angles, but uh, it has a very high degree of probability. That is, I'm not at all inclined to doubt it. I believe it strongly and rationally so according to Locke. But then if this relationship instead is a chance association of ideas, then we have madness. Okay. Um, as I said, I mean, this is important. Uh, especially because it's a case where we ought to be able to compare Locke to Hume, although it's not that easy. Um, I used to think it was easier, but I think I was wrong. Um, I didn't stop to consider that what Hume calls association of ideas, Locke may not be including as association of ideas in this chapter because he thinks it's rational. They may disagree about what what to what should be called reason, or maybe the disagreement is deeper. I'm not sure, but in any case, um, it's also uh, I guess important to un in or it's somewhat important in understanding when I go to on to talk about next, which is Locke's view about the meaning of words. Um, okay, I, I mean, and it's also interesting in its own right, because Locke says, and I don't think he excludes himself from this, that, you know, none of us can, should consider ourselves completely sane. This always happens to everyone. A good education would aim to minimize it, but uh, it obviously can't be completely eliminated. Um, it's also interesting to compare this view to what Spinoza and Leibniz say about similar topics, but I won't go into that. All right, so are there questions about madness? If not, I'm gonna go on to talk about words. That is book three. Okay, so um, by the way, is the sound acceptable now? It's still kind of sucks at the board, but you've been in front of the camera, so it's been good. Got it. Um, hmm. Let me just try one more time to switch to the other. Camera mic. Okay, now I'm next to the board. How is that? You couldn't hear me? Well, we had one vote for it's better. I say, let's try it. It's different. <laughs> okay, but, and can you hear me when I'm over here? Yeah, that's no problem. Okay, that must be the other camera then. All right. Um, okay, so book three, words. Um, Um, so, uh, 
Um, I guess I think to understand what's going on in book three in general, uh, the important thing to focus on is what Locke thinks is the proper use of language. Um, right, so book 10 of chapter three, which is the last part of the reading is called Of the Abuse of Words. Um, and of course, the abuse of something is a use, right? The abuse of some, so the abuse of words is a use of words, but not the proper use of words. That's what that chapter is about, the improper use of words. So the, that title by itself already implies words have a proper use, according to law. Words have a proper use and an improper use, or perhaps more than one improper use. So, um, so what's interesting about this is that um, as book three, chapter 10 goes on, one of the main complaints about various abuses of words is that, um, that uh, they render language useless. By useless, obviously, what he has to mean is, again, not that they don't involve any use of language, because an abuse is a use of something, but rather that they don't contribute to any proper use of language. Um, and in this connection, I think especially interesting is Book 3, Chapter 10, Section 7. So in Section 7, He's talking about um, the scholastic emphasis on one's ability to prevail in disputes. Um, right, they used to, uh, in medieval, and I guess also still early modern universities, uh, the, they used to put a lot of emphasis on, they would hold these formal disputations between people. And, you know, uh, it was important to see how well you could do in those things. That was like, uh, you know, a test of how good you were. Um, and there were a lot of related practices, right? Of like students putting questions on the master's door and, um, you know, then the master having to answer them and deal with objections. Um, so it's that whole use of language for like disputation to see who can sustain their position against other people that Locke is criticizing in section seven and eight. Um, and, you know, this is particularly interesting because this is very much an emphasis in contemporary philosophy as well. Um, so for example, you know, when you're deciding whether to hire someone, um, you know, once you have the list narrowed down to a certain, uh, to a short list, you will bring them to each of your campus and have them give a talk. And then after the talk there's a question and answer period, and the questions very often are objections and um, the candidate is being evaluated based on how well they can handle that type of question. Um, so Locke says that um, this whole practice is quote, very useless. <laughs> um, here's, Back to the document camera. Um,
right? So this is what people do with words, Locke says, when you measure their ability this way, by their ability to prevail in disputes. They, in, they uh, um, use language so as to perplex, involve, and subtleize the signification of sounds, so as never to want something to say in opposing or defending any question. The victory being adjudged not to him who had the truth on his who had truth on his side, but the last word in the dispute. So this this again is about order. Right? If you want to discover truth, the proper order is the order of reason. Um, and uh, if instead you set up an order where the last word will be the one who person who won the argument by playing with the meanings of words, then you're abandoning reason. So, and then the next section, section eight begins, this, though a very useless skill, and that which I think the direct opposite to the ways of knowledge had, hath yet passed hitherto under the laudable and esteemed names of subtlety and acuteness. So, um, and now I think you can see better what I'm saying about what useless has to mean here. Because when he says it's a very useless skill, it's not useless. He just said what it's useful for. It's really useful for winning disputes, right? If you wanted, what you want to do is win disputes, then this is the way you should use your words. So, um, so the point must be that winning disputes is not part of the proper use of language. And therefore this, use of word, which is good for winning disputes, is not good for the proper use of language and is in that sense useless. Well, um, so uh, what is the proper use of language? And I think part of the reason is, part of the answer is found further down in that same section, section eight towards the end of the section, right hands, where he says, it appears in all history that these profound doctors were no wiser nor more useful than their neighbors and brought but small advantage to human life or the societies wherein they lived. So um, the proper use of language um, at least the one he's measuring it by there and calling it useless is the proper use of language is some kind of benefit to society. use of language as opposed to the socially beneficial use of language. Um, and that actually makes a lot of sense based on what we're, I was talking about last time about Locke's ethics, right? Where if you want to ask whether something is morally good, then Locke will say first, well, morally good relative to what law? Ah, so April says, so useful isn't about expressing truth. Well, I mean, that's the next question that has to be asked. What is the socially beneficial use of language? But for, for now, all we know is that the proper use of language is supposed to be socially beneficial. Right, because when he, he, when he criticizes this other use of language and calls it useless, by which he must mean without proper use or not contributing to the proper use, he um, says you can tell it doesn't because it hasn't been socially beneficial, right? Those profound doctors who were so subtle 
in their use of words to win disputes, you know, didn't benefit the societies that they lived in. Whether that's true or not is a good question. Also, you know, whether um, current day philosophers benefit the society they live in, whether Locke benefited the society he lived in. I mean, all those are open questions, <laughs> but, uh, but in any case, he thinks that you will definitely agree with him that um, you being what? Well, I mean, you being modern and enlightened, basically, um, especially if you're Protestant. But if you're a Cartesian, you know, I mean, Descartes also is pretty harsh on, on medieval philosophy. So, but in any case, so he assumes you'll agree that these profound doctors were not socially beneficial. And therefore we can tell right away that they weren't using language properly. He hasn't yet said how the proper use benefits society. But what I, and I am gonna go on to talk about that and explain what, or at least try to explain what it's supposed to have to do with truth, according to him. But, um, but before I say that, I just want to point out that this is completely expected given Locke's ethics. As I was starting to say before, if you ask Locke in general, you know, what is the good way to use thing X? So first he's going to say, well, do you mean what is good period, because then you mean like, what is the way to use it? So it will be pleasurable or a means of obtaining pleasure for me. <laughs> and you say, no, no, I meant what is the morally good way of using it? Right, that is, what is the way of using it that should be, well, that should be rewarded rather than punished? And, you know, then he'll say, well, according to which law? According to the civil law, which civil law? According to the law of opinion, which law of opinion? And you say, no, no, I mean, really, like, absolutely subject to reward and punishment. And then he'll say, oh, you mean the divine law, the law of reason, right? The law of reason. And now I think we start to understand better why the order of reason is the order that's opposed both by madness, but also is the order that's opposed by abuse of words. Um, because the order of reason would be the, um, should be in conformity to the law of reason, which is the divine moral law. And as I argued last time, you know, uh, according to Locke, how do we know what the divine law is? Um, now, I mean, he doesn't dispute that that we, you know, that there's we have a Christian revelation that if you understand these books correctly, you'll get the correct divine law. Out of them. Although he does point out many times that it's hard to understand ancient texts. And it's very easy to misunderstand it. Um, so, uh, um, but there's another way which we don't need any texts for, he says, which is just to use our reason. And I was at least trying to claim last time that what we reason use our reason to do is to reason about public utility, right? So we ask, is this a morally good in accordance with the law of reason, use of X, what we're asking is, is this use of X good for everyone on the whole? Where there, that last use of good just meant pleasurable or a means of obtaining pleasure, right? So it's a version of utilitarian ethics. So it's not surprising to learn that in the special case of language, he also thinks that the proper use of it is going to be the socially beneficial or publicly useful use. Um, um, 
And so, you know, as usual in this case, we find that that this morally good use may conflict with um, at least if you forget about divine reward and punishment, it may conflict with the what's personally good for the user. And again, these these schoolmen are a perfect example. If they're going to be rewarded with authority and um, power and perhaps even wealth because of their skill in disputing, then use of language for winning disputes is the best use for them, right? But to get them to do to use it in the morally good way instead, we have to appeal to divine reward and punishment. So we'll say to them, yes, you might get rich and powerful by using it this way, but you'll pay for it in the after. Although also, if we get so far as to notice that, then we should modify our law of opinion and perhaps even our civil law, right? So as not to wait for divine reward and punishment, but to already like shun people who use, you know, look down on people who use words in this disputatious way. Obviously, Locke is attempting to achieve that in part in this text, right? To make us um, look down on this way of using words, to change the law of opinion so that rather than praising them as subtle and acute, we'll condemn them as useless wranglers, right? And, you know, possibly depending on how bad the societal effects of this is, we could imagine opposing criminal penalties on them for using words this way. Um, um, don't believe Locke actually thinks that would be a good idea, um, but uh, Hobbes probably thinks that would be a good idea. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, so what is the social use of language? Yeah, I'm going back to that. What is the social beneficial use? And the answer is um, that it's communication of ideas. Now, I mean, Locke also not that often, but consistently when it comes up mentions another use of language, which is a private use to record my own thoughts for my own benefit. Um, and he says it doesn't make that much difference what words I use for that. Although obviously there's certain things I could do that would confuse myself and it would be bad for me. But in any case, for the most part, he's focusing on this publicly useful use, this public usefulness of language. And the public usefulness of language, he always says, is communication of ideas. So communication of ideas, let me uh, erase a lot of this stuff. So communication of ideas um, works like this. Um, there's two people, there's a speaker and a listener. And the speaker has an idea X. And the speaker wants to get the listener to also have the idea X. Now, um, I think to understand this correctly, we have to say not just the speaker wants the listener to have the idea X, but the speaker wants to get the listener to realize that they have the idea X, right? So in other words, the listener, right? Because like, for example, if I wanted you to have the idea white, the easiest way to do it would be to put something white right in front of your eyes. Then you would get the idea white because it would that white thing would force you to perceive it. But I think um, that wouldn't count as communication of ideas. Um, uh, I mean, 
unless somehow you knew that the reason I was putting it in front of your face was because I had the word idea white and I wanted you to get it. So, um, so in other words, the listener um, is supposed to get the idea X, but like previous to the speaker. Now, I mean, I'm not going to say a lot more about that, or maybe anything more about that, except that this appears to be another difference in the way you can have an idea. Just like you can have an idea with the consciousness that you've had it before in memory. It seems like you can have an idea with the consciousness that it comes from someone else. Um, okay, so in any case, so I want the speaker to have the idea X. So in order to get the speaker to have the idea X, I'm gonna make a certain sound. Yeah, you know, call this sound S. Now, I mean, when I say I make a certain sound, obviously it's some part of my body that does that. Certain various parts of my body that make that sound. Um, and even assuming the mind is part of the body, it's probably not those parts of the body, it's probably the brain or, but you know, anyway, be that as it may. So uh, it, it doesn't, I mean, even if those parts are somehow the same as the mind, they don't make that sound by having an idea, they make that sound by moving and, and thereby causing other bodies to move by impulse, the way bodies always affect them. So, um, but presumably, you know, since I'm doing this is my time. <laughs> yeah. All right. Okay, this is your time. So presumably, you know, however, the way the speaker gets to make this sound involves first entertaining the idea S and then somehow, you know, however the will works. I'm able to um, turn that imagining of a sound into movements of my body that will make the sound actually occur. So somehow I get from the idea X to the idea X. And then from that to the sound X, but um, that part's actually not that important. Right, like how this works in between is not important. What's important is that the listener, through the ordinary act of perception, therefore also gets the idea S. Right, because the sound S, um, however sounds do this, causes them to perceive the idea S. Now I'm calling these things S and X. I mean, I can, I can obviously supply an example, like call the idea X white, but from then on it gets pretty confusing because the sound is, what sound is it? It's the sound white. <laughs> right? I mean, and what idea, what is the idea S? Well, it's the idea of the sound white. So they're all called white, which, you know, makes sense, right? Because this sound is the name of this idea. The sound that, that, that stands for this idea. So anyway, right? So from the idea S, I get the X, I get the idea S somehow. Then I like change that into a physical signal. It goes to the listener. They, you know, using their ordinary um, sense organs, change that back into the idea S. And then they have to be able to go in the opposite direction to get from the idea S to the idea X. And again, somehow, because the sound came from me, they not only get the idea X, but they realize that I have it. And then I'm communicating it to them. So, right, so that's how communication of ideas is supposed to work. Now, um, what, however, is the relationship between these two ideas X and X. So 
So there's no natural connection between those two ideas. I mean, certainly not in the sense of a like visible necessary connection, right? Like the connection between the idea of a triangle or the, the, the idea of the three interior angles of the triangle and the idea of two right angles. There isn't some kind of um, way I can see that self-evidently X goes together with S. But not only that, there isn't like a natural cause and effect connection either. Um, right, that is the way the speaker gets the X is not by inferring from the sound X using reasoning based on cause and effect, but the speaker must have had the idea X. That would be like an example where it does work. That would be what may, that way might be if I'm blushing, right? So I'm blushing, someone sees me blushing and they infer from the usual course of cause and effect with some probability that I'm embarrassed or ashamed because they know that being embarrassed or ashamed tends to cause blushing. But when I make the sound white, there isn't an inference like that going on. There's no supposed natural law that results in me making that sound. Um, because after all, you know, human beings who speak other languages don't make that sound at all when they have the idea white. So, um, so it's not a connection like that. So you might think on the other hand, well, maybe it's a connection, it's a chance connection due to habit. I happen to have heard the sound white a lot of times in the past when I saw white things. And so the ideas have come to be joined together in my mind. And when I hear the sound, I immediately imagine the idea. It's as if I actually saw something white. Now, I mean, of course, as we know, Locke admits that that happens, but uh, he doesn't think that um, that's a good thing, right? That kind of habit, it would be habit would be irrational, and it would be a form of madness. In fact, I think that kind of form of madness Locke believes is involved in some of the abuses, um, or uh, maybe not deliberate abuses of words, but the um, imperfections of language, the way people start to treat the words as if they were the things. Right, they form such a close association between the sound and the thing that they don't realize when they no, when they're no longer talking about the thing at all and just the sound remains. So, um, so, so I think that is so. I think Locke thinks that does happen. Right, which which suggests that language, although it's Locke says it's absolutely necessary for human society. He says that at the very beginning of book three. Um, language is necessary, but there's a certain danger involved in it. Right? We're always in danger of confusing words with things, basically, because of this form of association. But that's not the way it's supposed to work. So how is it supposed to work? Well, the answer is, but this connection is supposed to be voluntary. That is, I set a rule to myself on purpose that when I want to communicate the idea X to someone, I will make this sound S. Um, Now, I mean, of course, this rule will only do any good if the listener knows about the same rule. 
right? So not only do I have to have reached a decision in my mind personally that whenever I, I wanna communicate the idea X, I'll make this sound S, but the listener has to um, know that that's the rule I'm following. So therefore, for this to be useful, it has to be um, not just a private rule that I've made, it has to be a public rule. It has to be a rule that a lot of people have set. Now, so if I'm going to voluntarily do something in a way that wasn't my personal decision, but that a lot of people agree on together, Basically what that means is I have to consent to a convention. Right, I have to voluntarily allow my will to follow the same rule that everyone else um, has agreed on. If I'm just tricked into doing it or something, then I'm not really doing it voluntarily and we're back in the madness case. So therefore, Locke says, this is book three, uh, chapter two, section two on page 364. When he represents to himself other men's ideas by some of his own, Now, never mind what that means. That's a little complicated in context, but this is where he says consent. If he consent to give them the same names that other men do, to still his own ideas, to ideas that he has, and not to ideas that he has not. So, I mean, the the place, the thing I wanted to focus that they are for now is just the word consent. Right? That is using common words with everyone else to represent my ideas is a political act of consent to um, uh, public views. Now, you might say, Locke, well, you know, when did we consent to that? Like, if you look at children learning language, did anyone ever ask their consent? Um, this is exactly the problem that comes up in Locke's political philosophy when he says that, um, uh, you know, a legitimate government has to rule by the consent of its subjects. And again, you ask, wait, when did I ever consent to this government? I was born here. I was born under this government. And in his uh, political theory, that is in the second treatise, on government, Locke solves this by explaining in what situations we can be taken to have given a tacit consent to the government we live under. And he appeals to the same thing here. His true common use by a tacit consent appropriates certain sounds to certain ideas in all languages. By in all languages, he means not the same sounds in all languages, but he means in any language there's that people speak they've all tacitly consented to use certain sounds to represent certain ideas. That's what makes it one language. Um, so that's the answer. It's going to potentially face some of the problems that Locke's theory of tacit consent 
faces in general. Um, like, for example, suppose I now just want to withdraw my consent. Can I really do that? Um, um, won't I, well, I mean, or to, to put it another way, I won't normally want to. Why not? Because having grown up among speakers of this language, I have a huge investment. They're the people who understand me and I understand them. Um, and, uh, and they probably are the people who live near me and have you know, control over my possessions and other stuff like that. And to withdraw my consent now from that language would be difficult and very inconvenient, if not actually dangerous. Right, so it's the same thing, you know, you can say, as Locke does say, I mean, you know, is this, is this true in actual states? Well, you know, usually not, sometimes maybe, but, you know, Locke says that anyone who wants to no longer be a subject of that government, all they have to do is, um, withdraw their tacit consent. But then he adds, in order to do that, they have to stop using the benefits of living under that government, which basically means they can't walk on the common roads, they can't own property, they have to leave. They have to go somewhere else. And unless they're gonna go into the wild, they're gonna to have to live under a different government. So again, like this privilege we have of withdrawing our consent is not that easy to exercise. Okay, uh, I mean, is that important in the case of language or not? Well, um, I mean, language causes political difficulties and sometimes even more, I guess. So, um, so there are real, you know, there are, let's say, regular old political issues connected with this, but right, like in Quebec, for example. But um, but more than that, it's something about like, um, and this is an issue that comes up in Wittgenstein sometimes, um, that it seems like our whole transmission of language and culture, generally speaking, to the next generation involves coercion. Um, which is kind of a problem. In any case, getting back to Locke doesn't meant, doesn't bring up any of that. Although the things he says here when he appeals to consent and tacit consent imply all those issues, I think, even for in his own mind, he knows that those things are connected. Um, but okay, so anyway, forget all of that. So the way it's supposed to work then is that um, I have given my consent to a certain convention and the listener is, I mean, the listener doesn't necessarily have to give consent to that convention themselves if they never want to say anything back, but they have to at least know that convention and know that I'm a party to it, meaning they have to understand my language. They have to know what language I speak, and they have to understand my language, I mean, they have to know what those rules are I've consented to. And if all of that is in place, then this transmission will work. Didn't get to that quite as quickly as I hoped to, but. Um, right, but I, so I haven't got to talk about truth yet. Um, so I might have to skip some stuff later to make sure I get to that because it's super important. Okay, well, so, but first I want to talk about how words signify ideas versus how ideas signify things. So Locke, you know, uh, I think consistently says that there are two types of signs, verbal signs and mental signs, that is words and ideas. 
Or similarly, he says there are two types of propositions, verbal propositions and mental propositions, right? A verbal proposition is a certain kind of connection between two words, that is between two sounds or two written marks. But he usually doesn't talk about writing, even though the way he's communicating to us is exclusively by writing. But anyway, so it's a certain kind of way that two sounds are put together by other sounds. That's a verbal proposition. And whereas a mental proposition is uh, the assertion that two ideas agree or disagree. Assertion inside my mind that they agree or disagree, taking them to agree or disagree, something like that. Um, but I think it's important to realize that these two types of signs are not signs in the same way. So the way words are signs of ideas, and I mean, of course, so the word, properly speaking, is this sound. Um, so in some sense, when we say that the word is a sound of a sign of the idea, we mean that this sound is a sign of the idea. Um, but um, um, the mental process that goes on takes you from this idea to this to the idea of the sound. How this further translation works, I don't even know. Right, like, I don't know how, like, unless I've studied phonology, I probably don't even know what my lips and tongue and vocal cords, et cetera, do when I make the sound white. Let alone do I know how imagining hearing that sound in a certain way causes something to happen in the brain, it causes something to happen in nerves, it causes my tongue and my lips and whatever to do that. So, like, so and similarly, the speaker has to go from the idea of us. Again, the speaker doesn't know how the, what the sound actually is, or they don't have to know what the sound actually is as a physical process, or how their ear works, or how their you know, nerves that work from the, go from their ear to their brain work and so forth. If they just have to go from the sound, the idea of the sound to X. So I'm gonna talk about the sentence that the idea of S is the sign of the idea of X. And the way it is, what we just said, it, um, according to an arbitrary rule, right, that is a rule that I voluntarily chosen, Um, S, uh, S should follow X. Right, like, I mean, you might kind of imagine that there's a whiteboard inside my head. Now, I mean, of course, there isn't anything like a whiteboard inside my head, I know. But, <laughs> um, but you can imagine that there's a kind of whiteboard inside my head and that I first write down X on it. That's having, or someone writes down X on it. Anyway, but that's having the idea X. And then the rule tells me, oh, well, if you've written down X, X, you must, or at least you can, because of course I don't have to communicate all my ideas. I couldn't communicate all my ideas. But so it's more like you may, a proper, so to speak, grammatical thing to write next would be X. So this relationship is called syntax. And we're talking about um, uh, usually thinking about spoken or written marks when we talk about syntax. Here we're talking about ideas, but it's the same point. It's an order in which ideas come after another according to certain arbitrary rules. So the sense in which this, the idea S is a sign of the idea X is that it's a syntactic consequence of the idea X. 
it's um, um, like I said, it's grammatically possible as the next thing after X, whereas some other sound, the idea of some other sound with the will to produce it, whatever that is, would be an improper uh, sign to follow X in the order of mental signs. It would be in, ungrammatical, so to speak, right? There would be a lack of agreement between the two. So it'd be like using uh, um, plural verb with a singular subject or something like that. Um, um, now, you might think this isn't a way of being a sign at all, but actually, I mean, it is a way of being a sign in the sense that, like, for example, um, one type of syntactical rule might allow me, let's say, to replace a sentence by an abbreviation for the sentence or by um, a sentence with the words rearranged that um, I'm guaranteed if I just do that rearrangement correctly and guaranteed will mean the same thing. Um, and in that case, we might well say that the second form is a sign of the first form. This is a kind of signification, syntactic signification. Um, but it's not the way the idea X is the sign of the quality X in an external object. Right? So the quality X in the external object has the power to cause me to perceive X whether I want to or not. So first of all, obviously this isn't a voluntary thing. But worse than that, it's not a connection between two things written down here at all, right? The quality X is not on this mental whiteboard. It's outside the mental whiteboard. I couldn't adopt a rule to always have the idea X after I, the quality X is present because um, the only way I know that the quality of X is present is because it forces me to perceive the idea X. Right, again, this is the usual problem that I can't even compare ideas to the problems that cause them. Um, because there's no way of getting around the idea and looking at the quality directly. So this is a completely different kind of signification. And this is basically what's called semantics. The way a sign in a language or in a system of signs refers to something outside of a system of signs. And at least in that language, you can't set that up as by arbitrary rules, right? Like if I wanted to say, okay, here's a rule. The word white is gonna stand for white. <laughs> um, obviously the word white already stood for white or else you wouldn't understand that sentence. So this is why at a certain time, when, People wanted to talk about this. Tarski introduced the concept of the meta language. Anyway, never mind that. <laughs> so, um, they, you know, that's not going to work in this. We can't leave this language of ideas in our mind and use another one, right? That's what we've got. So, um, so that's so we're dependent on not setting this up voluntarily at all, but relying on the qualities of things to keep doing it. Um, and why am I going into this so much? Well, because um, basically we're going to we're going to see that Barclay doesn't think that I, so. So Locke thinks that 
words or the ideas of words only signify uh, the ideas they stand for syntactically, but the ideas signify external objects semantically, they refer to them. So we're going to see that Barclay denies that ideas can ever do this. Right, he says every idea is just what it is and it doesn't point to something outside of it. Locke never really explained how it points to something outside of it. I mean, he explained when it does. It does when um, I've been caused to perceive the idea by that quality in the thing outside of it. That's what the idea is the idea of. But what that ofness, so to speak, of the idea is, or what in some fancy terms is called intentionality, Locke doesn't explain, or actually, or what um, Kant would call ob objectivity or objective validity or objective reality, Locke doesn't explain how that works. Barclay says, sure enough, he doesn't explain how it works because it doesn't make sense. Something can't be about something else. Everything is what it is. So, um, um, and, um, of course, when Barclay does that, he's not going to, um, then explain that no, the qualities of things actually are grammatically related to my ideas. He's going to say, there are no qualities of things. <laughs> there are only ideas, right? That, and that's going to be Barclay's extreme idealism. So um, Locke's way of getting out of that, if he has one, is going to be his way of avoiding Locke's extreme ideas conclusion. And um, you can guess that it has something to do with the fact that, according to Locke, there are these visible necessary connections between ideas, which Give, my, I give the structure of my ideas a, a resemblance to the object that's causing them. So that Barclay is going to have to deny that. Again. Okay, are there questions about that? I know that was a little bit, or maybe very abstruse. <laughs> I mean, it's, um, but I think. It's worthwhile, if you can, trying to think about it that way, because um, if only because uh, it will, it's difficult to understand what the disagreement between Locke and Barclay is exactly without looking at it this way. And I think Barclay um, does look at it this way because he keeps talking about language in this context, um, as we'll see. All right, um, so there's two things I wanted, still wanted to talk about. And one is the names of substances. And the other is rhetoric. So I think uh, names of substances comes, is this madness? <laughs> I think that names of substances is like uh, in some reasonable order comes first, but I'm more concerned that I get to the part about rhetoric. So I'm going to talk about that first. And if there's any time left over, I'm going to talk about names of substances. Although I realize, I think I've already, I, I put off talking about ideas of substances somewhat because I said, well, we'll talk about that when we get to names of substances. Now I'm going to have to put it off again to get to knowledge of substances. Well, anyway, but rhetoric, it's more important to talk about this. Um, so, um, so again, you can start understanding what the issue is here. If I like kind of fast forward to what Barclay is gonna say in response to everything Locke says about communication of ideas, and he's going to say, um, um, and why will he want to say this? Because he wants to say that 
Um, Locke says that general names work by standing for general ideas. So when I say a general name like white, it stands for the general idea of whiteness I have in my mind, and that's the idea I'm trying to communicate to you. Locke says, I mean, Barclay says there are no, are no abstract general ideas like that. So, um, so you know, according to Locke, that would mean saying that the, the general words are meaningless. So Barclay says, like, to begin with, look, who, whoever said that communication of ideas was the only use of language? He says, in fact, language has lots of other uses, for example, to excite passions. And he even gives the example of saying to someone, uh, when they ask you why you think something is true, you say, Aristotle hath said it. And he says, it doesn't work by exciting any idea, of, if it does work at all, it doesn't work by exciting any idea of Aristotle in your mind, because no idea, no idea of Aristotle that you could possibly form would back up the kind of authority people give Aristotle, he says. Rather, it works by just kind of like directly, you've, you've come to associate that word Aristotle with a certain feeling of respect. And you're like, oh, Aristotle. <laughs> so, I mean, even according to Barclay, that's a weird example because presumably he doesn't think you should do that. <laughs> but anyway, um, from that example, you can see what Locke's initial response to this would be, which is, well, of course, I never denied that language has other uses. I just denied that it has other proper uses. The other uses are improper, they're abuses, and why they're abuses? Because they're against public utility. They're not socially beneficial, or maybe they're socially harmful. But that itself, maybe when you think about it, and I think that was um, behind April's original question at 5.56 p.m., so <laughs> almost an hour ago, right? So wait, if, if the proper use of language is a socially beneficial use, does that mean that the proper use has nothing to do with truth? So, I mean, why might you think that? Well, you might think that the socially beneficial use of language, the use of language that society depends on is at least in large part, that use that Barclay is talking about, right? Like by getting people to have good feelings associated with something or other, like with the words, you know, USA or, you know, whatever. Um, or to have negative feelings associated with something like that, um, we, um, we have a way to like keep bodies of people aligned with each other without having to either make a lot of laws with you know, punishments and rewards, which are gonna be trouble to enforce um, because where are the people gonna come from who are loyal enough to enforce them, right? you know, um, without having to do that or, and without having to do a whole bunch of reasoning with everyone to like convince them that, hey, yeah, this, you know, this way of acting is for the best because blah, 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 blah. Instead, you know, we can use certain words or ways of speaking that, um, that get people to go along with them uh, without going through those channels. Both of those channels are basically rational channels, right? The, the, the second one appeals to your reason directly. The first one I mentioned, the rewards and punishments appeals to your reason by saying, well, I don't care if you agree this is the right thing to do. You should agree that it's a good thing for you to do because you're going to get punished if you don't. Right? So it, they're both rational. <laughs> but without having to go through those rational things, which would involve communicating my ideas to you, I can just get you to have certain passions by using language correctly. And you might think that society depends at least in part on that. I think Barclay thinks it does depend in part on that. Um, but Locke 
apparently thinks that um, the correct, the socially beneficial use of language is not just to transmit some ideas from you to you, but to get you to have ideas in the correct order so that you'll form true beliefs. So I have the ideas in the right way in you. Now I have to produce these sounds These are my ideas. These are your ideas. I produce this series of sounds in the right order. And that gets you to have the ideas in the right order so that you can see the connections between them, whether demonstrative or, or probable. So, in other words, the crop, the socially beneficial use of language is teaching, according to Locke. Instruction. Why would he think that? Well, one thing that um, that we know Locke thinks, and he's going to emphasize in Book Four is that if we only would think clearly about ethics, it would be just as demonstrative as mathematics. How the demonstrations would go, we'll have to talk about it later, but he thinks that um, if we would just, um, I mean, it's hard to do this, unlike in the case of mathematics, because in the case of mathematics, the conclusions don't interfere with our personal private interests, right? Whereas in the case of ethics, they often do. So, but, so it's hard to force ourselves to think clearly about it, as opposed to mathematics, which is relatively easy. I mean, mathematics isn't that easy either, right? But anyway, um, so, uh, um, uh, but he thinks if we could just overcome that and think about ethics as clearly as we think about mathematics, we could produce proofs in ethics that were as conv convincing as mathematical proofs. So if that's really the case, and you have to add, I guess, if it's the case that most people or a lot of people or the important people or something are gonna be capable of following those proofs. I think Locke thinks that if you just set out a proof clearly enough, anyone will follow it. Anyone who has the use of reason, I mean, because the, the connections that are immediately certain for one person are the same as the ones that are immediately connected to another person. Why he's sure of that, I don't know. So, but anyway, so if you think that it's not only possible to produce these proofs, but it's possible to get people to follow these proofs and accept the conclusion, then I think um, it would start to look like instruction was the only socially beneficial use of language. Um, this brings Locke close to Plato's Socrates. And I think actually Locke is thinking of Plato's Socrates when he says certain things about the meaning of words, which um, I probably won't get to talk about today, but maybe I'll talk about next time. But right, so um, so given that, if that's the case, then putting my words in some other order, using words that don't communicate my ideas, or putting them in the not putting them in the order that I see as the correct order of ideas, but using words that I think will affect the listener or putting them in an order that I think will affect the listener is a way of getting the listener to produce you know, ideas in the wrong order. In other words, it's like provoking madness, basically. So this is what like a rhetorician or an orator does. And Locke is saying that in general, that's an abusive language. 
And then he says, and it looks like I'm not going to get to the names of substances, but oh well. Um, names of substances are pretty important, but I think this is more important. So, uh, um, so he says, you know, um, this is what I think. But um, I know I'm going to get in trouble for saying this. Where is this? Oh, I'm in the wrong chapter. It's the end of chapter 10 on page 452. And he says, Um, it is evident how much men love to deceive and be deceived, since rhetoric, that powerful instrument of error and deceit, has its established professors, is publicly taught, and has always been had in great reputation. Right, so again, like Socrates, like Plato Socrates, who's, Plato Socrates is complicated, but let me just say, like Plato Socrates, he's at least apparently is criticizing all uh, rhetoricians and orators. Um, and I doubt not, but it will be thought great boldness, if not brutality in me. Brutality means like being like a beast, right, a brute if not brutality in me to have said thus much against it. Right, so people like to be deceived. What does this mean? Um, I mean, it either means they think it's good for them to be deceived, even though they know it's not good for the public interest, or it means they're misled into thinking that being deceived Perceived as good, something like that. I, I think each of those are both actually kind of plausible, and maybe Locke thinks they both happen. But in any case, and then he ends, this is the end of book three. No, so it's the end of book three, chapter 10. There's another book chapter that I didn't assign to. Eloquence, like the fair sex, has two prevailing beauties in it to suffer itself ever to be spoken against. And tis vain to find fault with those arts of deceiving, wherein men find pleasure to be deceived. So what's going on here? It's interesting. I feel like Locke must be aware of it. And if he is aware of it, I'm not sure what he means or what he's doing. Because remember when I talked before about the ambiguity of the English word man. Now, I mean, this kind of ambiguity of a word is exactly what Locke says is an abusive language, right? Like it's to, especially to take advantage of it, to use it for, first for one collection of simple ideas and then for another. That's definitely abusive language. And when you do it, as part of a transition from one point to another or a comparison that's supposed to drive home your argument or something like that, that's a classic case of rhetoric. And yet that's just what Locke is doing here, right? Because when he says uh, up here, it is evident how much men love to deceive, et cetera. So there he's not talking about men versus women. He's just talking about human beings. But then when he gets to here and he says eloquence like the fair sex. So the implicit comparison is something like, just like men love women and don't wanna hear them criticized, so too they love rhetoric and don't wanna hear it criticized. 
But when he says men love women and don't want to hear them criticized, I, you know, I mean, um, um, well, so I was going to say something like, of course, assuming Locke takes heteronormativity for granted. But if he's really thinking about Plato's Socrates, that's the last thing he can take for granted. That makes it even more complicated. Right? Locke is, of course, is completely aware of like Athenian homosexuality. Well, anyway, be that as it may. So, um, but at least I think, you know, when so when he says when or or implies men love women and don't want to hear them criticized, there he means men as opposed to women. So he's taken advantage of that ambiguity to do the exact thing he's criticizing here. And what that means, I'm not sure. I've noticed this some time ago and I'm still not sure what to say about it. But I will leave you on that note and uh, see you Thursday. And I'll see if there's anything I can do to get this, this software. It's called mm -hmm, to work better. Okay, see you then. Bye.